Hi, and today I'm going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons, a game that's actually near and dear to my heart. The entire thing I want to talk about in Dungeons and Dragons is why I actually think that tabletop RPGs, l l let's just even tabletop RPGs overall, are just important for creativity and for people to be able to creatively express themselves. For an example, character creation. You can make your character pretty much whatever the whatever you want. Like, at all. It doesn't really matter. You're not constrained, confined. Obviously, you have races and books, but, but, you know, it doesn't really matter. I mean, most of the time, if your game master would allow it, you can probably mix and match races. Like, for an example, D&D. You can probably do, like, a half-dragonborn, half-something if your game master allows it. That's just how it goes. The reason... I think these games are important for creative expression of oneself is because there's not really set rules. Like, okay, let me explain. There are set rules for Dungeons and Dragons and every other tabletop RPG game, but then you get a little something what's known as homebrew. And homebrew is basically where you take said rule, like let's say... You know, we'll take D&D. Your AC is, you know, like, let's just say it's 18. So, essentially, what you can do is... It's just 18, but let's say you want to get a little wacky, right? So you're like, okay, I'm a cleric, right? And your game master decides that they're going to get wacky. So they decide that, oh, well, you're following a god of armor... Awesome. You get a plus two to AC. I mean, it's not really in a book, to my knowledge. But you can do it. Like, monsters, for an example. You can follow the monster's manual and only use monsters from the monster's manual, but, you know, your game master can also homebrew stuff. Most magic items I've seen have not been pulled from the book. Why? Because they're special. Magic items need to be special to an individual or the party as a whole. So, they need, in my opinion, being crafted by the DM makes it more meaningful than, oh yeah, here's a magic item out of the book. Because, I mean, obviously you're going to have those ones like, oh, Cloak of Invisibility, right? Yeah, you know, that's also in the book there. You're going to have pretty much anything that does invisibility, Average stuff, but then you can have other ones that are just completely made up where they just give you bonuses to stats or take away from stats and give you bonuses and or they just do something wacky and they're not really that useful in combat. That, in my opinion, is the heart of D D. It's the getting together with a friend friend and or friends, typically friends, as you don't really want a party of one person. And being able to express yourself creatively. As the game master, you craft a world that you are building within the realms of most of what the book says. But the rest of it is for you and your friends to decide, and why shouldn't you have fun? I bring this up because I'm in the Dungeons & Dragons Club at my high school. And I actually got called the height of professionalism when it comes to game mastering or DMing, dungeon mastering. We refer to each other as DMs there because we don't play anything other than Dungeons and Dragons. I disagree with this statement. And, I mean, the friend who called me that was taken aback when he found out that I had given my players a blunderbuss that can either do 1 or 500 damage. However, there are stipulations. In boss fights, they can only use it if the majority of the party is dead. If, you know, the majority of the party is dead, there are six of them, so half of them have to die. And it's really just a panic button. And the reason I did that is because as a dungeon master, for me personally, it's important to craft a world that they enjoy spending time in. And that they enjoy being in and that they have fun in. So, yes, there's a lot of times, like, I'll admit it, I make the game hard. I do. I, I think that having a challenging opponent 
for your party is more fun than being like, oh, hey, 15 goblins, let's go steamroll them. So I like to make the game challenging, and that's why I gave them that stipulation of, yeah, if the majority of the party is dead, you can use it. Now, they can also use it in normal encounters, because honestly, why not? Let's just have fun. That, that's my thing. If it's not related to the story, just have fun. Even if it is related to the story, have fun. That is the point of D&D, is just have fun. Do what you want. Most things are decided by dice rolls, because it is a world of chaos. And we have stat bonuses to help mitigate that and bring some normality into the chaos. But the part of the reason D&D is so fun is because of that chaos. So being calling a DM or a game master or whatever, you're so professional, I don't think that's the right term for it. Reason being is that there's not really professionalism inside of D&D. I mean... Sure, you can have established rules that an entire community agrees upon, but at the end of the day, you're not trying to play for the entire community. You're playing for your group of friends. And that's what's important, is that all of you collectively can get together and just have fun, because that's what D&D is. So, when he was taken aback that I gave them this magic item, it kind of shocked me, because... They worked for it, and, and he was really taken aback by the fact that I let one of my players kill a god that I homebrewed. I don't really find that shocking, in my opinion, as I'm just letting them have fun. That's the main purpose, is, for an example, that my friend, you know, that player, who killed the god, proceeded to get trapped in that dimension because they had no other way to pull her back out. So, the party went along in their things until another party member, who's playing a Kenku, stumbles across a cult. The cult is praying to the god that the halfling had killed. Halfling barbarian, by the way, and a Kenku rogue. So, the Kenku walks, somehow, I, I, I don't remember how, gets, like, initiated, basically, with one of the cultists going, Are you here for the meeting? And the Kenku says it, the Kenku does the chant, and out walks their friend, just out of the portal, riding an Ankylosaurus, because another member of my party has pet Ankylosaurus, because why not? I mean, sure. So, they have an Ankylosaurus, riding the Ankylosaurus, and the cult members all start praying, you know, to the party member. So, now you have the Kenku Rogue, who is through some entire thing of, you know, they're pretty sure the other, <laughs> the halfling is a god. Um, Kenku and the halfling are now being treated as deities by, you know, the cult. So, I like this because, I, I mean, yes, I, I designed it, but I really enjoyed the pure, like, enjoyment on their faces when they got to this point. Because a lot of them had thought that, like, the party member was going to have to make a new character. But, you know, no. I'm not going to do that. So, for me personally, it's the simple fact of the enjoyment that they got from that entire thing, the laughter I heard. That's what makes me feel happy when I play Dungeons & Dragons and I DM the game. It isn't something of, like... We have to stick to the rules like this now and be professional. It's, are you having fun? And if someone's not having fun, I like to do what I can to make them have fun. So I really don't think there is true professionalism inside of Dungeons and & Dragons. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's actually why so many games struggle to emulate it. I mean, so many Dungeons & Dragons games have come out and they've just been meh. Because of that fact, how do you translate a game that is pure chance and chaos and just wacky shenanigans with your friends to a video game? Well, that becomes very hard because every journey in D&D is different. And if you make a single player game, then it's calculated. You know what's going to happen once you finish the game and any replay, it's... Same old, same old. And yet, 
I think Tiny Tina has captured it very well. Not because it's super random, but because of the story. The story is just that. It's a story that is fun, but it emulates D&D with the wackiness. And, you know, I've heard a few people go, eh, I don't really like this story. That's fine. Um, they seem to be in the minority, which I agree with. I actually think Tiny Tina's is the best Dungeons & Dragons-esque game that's released simply because of the fact that the story is just chaotic. I mean, it's a well-crafted story in my opinion, but you have so many, like, shenanigans and hijinks that go on and, you know, an entire thing of, like, I'm not going to try to spoil it, but who the main villain actually turns out to be. It's kind of like one of those things if it's like, yeah, I can see that. That feels like D&D. And then you have Cyberpunk 2077, which is based off of a completely different tabletop RPG. Cyberpunk 2020 and Cyberpunk Red. I've been playing through Cyberpunk, and the only mechanic that they're missing is cyberpsychosis, basically, in your empathy meter. Which is fine. I think that would have been a very hard game mechanic to get in there. But personally, the more I've been playing the game, I actually do love Cyberpunk 2077. I think it's a good game now that it's fixed. But part of me thinks that it actually should have been pushed back a little bit more. And maybe somehow, because I know they're going to make a... They're, they're probably going to make a sequel. I hope they do, honestly. I hope they make another Cyberpunk game. And this time, I hope there is that meter, which... Maybe some people would find it mundane, but I find it a really cool mechanic that in order to not go absolutely batshit insane and murder every child you see on the street, you have to go to therapy. And that replacing parts of your body with, you know, cybernetic implants drops your humanity. I think that's an interesting mechanic that while very hard to pull off in a game, would be absolutely worthwhile. So let's get into the final topic of the video. The Dungeons and Dragons movie that's coming out. Alright. I've heard a few different takes. I've heard some people say that the movie's just gonna be bad no matter what. I disagree. I've seen some people get up in arms that, oh, the tiefling doesn't look like a tiefling. Dude, it's Dungeons and Dragons. Like, yeah, we have a tiefling in the player's handbook, so what? That's not necessarily what tieflings look like. Tieflings look like whatever you want them to be. I've also heard the arguments, tabaxis should be banned because haha -ha, furry. Dude, I don't know what high horse you're on, your group of people who ban tabaxis, but I'm not gonna lie, back like 20 years ago, this is the hobby that would get us bullied. And I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, tabaxis are cool fight me on that. They are. Are they my favorite race? No. Elves are my favorite race. Is that because I play cleric and they get a wisdom bonus? Yeah. Fight me. But that's the thing. A race doesn't have to look like what it does in the player's handbook. It's D&D. It's whatever the hell you want it to be. It's if you want to go with your friends, right, and you're the game master, and you're like, Alright guys, today you're fighting a giant acorn. Congrats, you can! It's D&D. The purpose is to have fun. It's not some just overly strict, you have to stick to this, your character has to look like this. It is literally a, what do you want your character to be? It is a role-playing game. You connect with people there. You connect with your friends there. And that's all it is. So personally, my hope for the D&D &D movie is that it doesn't take itself too seriously. Because I think if it takes itself too seriously, it's gonna flop. I think what they need to embrace is the nature of D&D &D and embrace the chaos. And embrace just the hijinks that go on. Don't take yourself too seriously in Dungeons & Dragons. At some parts in the story, yes. Like, if you're having a story with a serious tone during the main story, try to respect your game master, and if that's what they want, then yes. But remember that at the end of the day, it is about you and your friends having fun. So that's it. Just have fun with them. 
don't care what other people think. If other people think it sucks, too bad. That's their opinion. It's you and your friends, not them and your friends. And I just want people to know that. And if you're thinking of getting into D&D &D and you don't have friends who are, plenty of people will be willing to teach you. I mean, I, I genuinely think that it's a game that is so heavily important to creative freedom and creative expression that I really do think that if you like RPGs, you should try it at least once in your life, in my opinion. So... That's really just my thoughts on Dungeons and Dragons and kind of why I love it so much. Hey guys. So, a little bit of a different video here because I didn't really do anything different here. But, you know, I just wanted to say thanks for watching if you did watch. It means a lot to me. And, you know, overall, just thank you. Really, thank you for everything. Thank you for your viewership, your time, and it's almost the holidays. For me, it's almost Hanukkah. So, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, Kwanzaa, and honestly, I hope you just enjoy your holidays. You're all the same beautiful people as always. Every two weeks I say that. Because you are. You are all beautiful people. And I do want to give you an update. I've started my next big video project. It is going to be about... Cyberpunk 2077, so if you're interested in that, feel free to tune in. Um, I don't know when it'll be done. My guess is probably February. So, I say February. If you, it, it could already be out, depending on when you're watching this. So, for time's sake, February of 2023. So, thank you for your viewership. I hope you have a lovely day, and happy holidays. Peace. Hi, and today I'm going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons.